What's up here? My name is Kevin, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Um, and I'm okay telling you that. Uh, I've been sober since June 28th in 1987, one day at a time through the power of the 12 steps and what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, because of that, I've been able to do other things in my life, and one of those things was go to law school. And uh, as a result of continuing on a daily basis to do what we do here, um, I have the opportunity to uh, hang out with you today and just share some thoughts about copyright law as it relates to the archives. Hold on, I have way too much stuff up here. Um, and then really talking about the founding collection issues that you guys might come up with. And if we have a little time, I, I might hit on the deed of gift. I think that's probably the easiest piece of this. All right, you want to start, Bob? Let's, we'll start ripping through this. Um, when I started thinking about this <coughs> as, a, uh, as a copyright lawyer for the clinic, I have a lot of different clients who are not, who are not otherwise bound by things in AA that we are bound to like um, our guiding principles, right? We have traditions, we have steps, we have concepts, we have things that the rest of the world doesn't really think about. Um, and I think that that's something we can't lose sight of when we start looking at how we treat the world as an organization, uh, how, we, how we're perceived outside as an organization. Oh, cool. Right button. Only hit the right button. Yeah, that was great. Um, so I wanted to start here before we actually hit the IP. Do I point it somewhere? You just pointed it there. Yeah. Is it working? No. No. Great button. You can always say next slide. Next slide, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh, wait. Hold on. Okay. Next, next slide, Bob. All right. So copyright, I, just to give you the basics, it's going to, it protects the original work of an authorship. Um, and so a great example for me is if Bob and I decide to go to Starbucks after this meeting and write a poem about a pumpkin, uh, when both of us sit down on either sides of Starbucks and we write a poem about a pumpkin, we both own copyright in it. So it doesn't matter. It can be a crayon on a napkin. But the idea here is an author is really anyone uh, who creates um, an original work that's fixed. <clears throat> so we're talking about a tangible expression. After 1978, and we'll get into the chart in a second, protection is, is basically automatic upon creation. So I own the poem about the pumpkin because I wrote it. And as long as I don't assign that over to somebody else, I continue to own that for quite a long time. The second last bullet says you, you could and you should register to gain access to federal protection. So as soon as I write that poem on a napkin, I have general common law copyright protection, but I don't have access to the U.S. Copyright Act. In order to do that, I need to, to register with the Library of Congress to get that protection. Next slide, Bob. Um, I wanted to, and again, I'll make these slides available to whoever wants them, but if you look at the circular on copyright.gov, they're going to give you a grid. Um, and also, Cornell does a really nice job of working through the web of um, public domain and when the actual term for a copyright expires. I just gave you a snapshot here, and you can see that um, maybe with our first and second editions, uh, we might have a problem in that second line. So if it's published between 23 and 63 and never renewed, our work will be in the public domain. Uh, again, I don't know if we want to spend a lot of time with this now, but I, I give you two resources. Um, and what this means is when you have a very fact-specific question. So I have an article, it was written in X year, it was published or it was not published, there is a copyright notice affixed to it or not, then you look at the grid to figure out where it falls and whether or not we have protection. So if you guys don't have something like that, I can certainly provide it and uh, continue to give you guidance on that. Um, hey, how you doing? All right, so what does the Copyright Act of 1976 protect? It's a bundle of rights and they're severable, which means I, you know, if I wanted to, as the owner, let, let my friend Jeff um, publicly display my copyrighted work, or if I want Bob to be able to make copies of, the, of those works, I can dice them up because I have these, these um, five to six general um, rights that I'm given under copyright. So the right, obviously, to reproduce, to make copies, which is why we call it copyright. Uh, but pr pr to prepare derivative works, so a work from a work, 
Um, and then to distribute copies, display it, I can do all these things. And now under the law, it, it, uh, as I said, it, it does attach upon creation. So when somebody creates a work, they literally own the copyright to it. And we as an organization need to understand that. Um, and then it also, it, it protects the expression of an idea, not the idea. So go to the next slide and I'll try to walk you through this. So if I have an idea that I want to write um, a treatise on, uh, you know, Bill Wilson, that idea means nothing. That idea is just an idea. But once I start writing it, and I, and I transform, and I've done something creative, I'm going to then gain copyright protection over it. So what does copyright not protect? Recipes, um, just basic facts, titles to books sometimes, anything that, that really um, doesn't have that transformative originality to it is not going to probably have copyright protection. That's just a general, um, a general uh, consensus in the, in the uh, copyright world. So again, um, I gave you a couple examples. <coughs> Familiar symbols, designs, listing of ingredients, short phrases, none of that's going to be copyrightable. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to tell you about the DMCA because this gets us into the 21st century and um, a lot of issues that we might actually struggle with as an organization. So the DMCA, DMCA is really designed to protect a lot of the, the newer online internet-based copyright infringement that can occur. Um, and so the example I give you is that if you defeat copyright um, on a site by, you know, defeating the encryption and then pulling something <coughs> off of a website, you could be subject to the DMCA. All you need to know about this is that there is a copyright law and then there's this additional Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is a supplement to that, that handles a lot of on -site, um, on, online activity. Um, and it means you've got duplicative legal action. So if Alcoholics Anonymous as an organization decides it's going to go rip off some website, we could face action underneath the Copyright Act and we can face a second action underneath the DMCA. So just think about that. Be very careful with websites. So we got two buckets of recourse that I don't want you guys to forget about. The one is the, the laws. So I just gave you a very quick review of, of copyright law, the DMCA and some others. But then we've got website terms of use. So a lot of times I've seen people and people at the clinic do this all the time and they ask me these questions. You know, it looks like it's in the public domain. It's a public facing website. I think this is okay. And then they just take an image or they take an article and then I get, you know, a letter that says, why did you do that? Um, please pay us money for that or stop using it. Um, and the reality is almost every website has terms of use for reprints and for permissions. And when you're looking at a, something you really like on a website, go down to the frame at the bottom and click on the terms of use or the privacy policy or whatever it is, and you will be surprised to find the restrictions that they have in place. Next one. Okay, so what is infringement? It's the unauthorized use of somebody else's copyright. This is what we don't want to do, right? We don't want to be known individually or as an organization as, as something that goes out there and infringes other people's work. Um, it's a strict liability tort, which means you don't have to prove intent. I don't have to prove that Bob intended to go out and steal my stuff. All I got to do is prove that it actually happened. So Bob had access to it, and I can prove that it was substantially similar to, to the thing that I originally wrote. <coughs> All right, next slide. Um, potential liability. I know this sounds very legal, but we'll, we'll work a little AA into it. I just want you to see these are the things that actually do happen on a daily basis in this country when copyright infringement claims go down. Uh, you can get injunctions, you can destroy uh, the, uh, the, all the um, inventory that you've created, you got to disgorge your money that you made off of it. There's a lot of things that can happen. Most important, I want you to see this one because statutory damages are much easier to define than actual damages. So actual damages, Bob stole my thing and I figured it should have gone to 15,000 people at $1.23 a pop 
and so my actual damage is Rx. That can be kind of complicated. So the law says, well, if, if Bob was to willfully infringe, which means you knew it was copyrighted and you took it anyway, then let's just give it a standard figure. How about 150,000? And so that's what the law says. So if I can prove willful infringement, which literally means I knew it was copyrighted and I took it anyway, then I could be liable for $150,000 for that infringement. Kevin, is that, is that a one-off or is that uh, per copy? It's per infringement, not per copy. So if you do, if you take Article A and you copy it 5,000 times, you get dinged for Article A once. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so just think about that. Okay, and then my but we sourced slide. This is probably my favorite slide because when we were in third grade, we learned, you know, I remember Sister Mary Luisha taught me that I was supposed to source from my guides in order to write a paper properly. And so we learned that all the way through school. And then we get somebody's copyright and we source it. And we think we're cool because we're giving this guy credit. The problem is we might have inadvertently proved willful infringement, right? Because I knew it was copyrighted. <coughs> I took it anyway. And now I have proof that I knew it because I sourced it. Um, this becomes a really fact specific exercise. I think it's a good process and anyone who's in, in um, the university world, I know a few of you are, it's a, a, most people will be happy when you source them. But you never know about your thin skinned plaintiff. You, know, you don't know about the wild card who might not be happy that you're advertising for him or getting his work even further spread around the country. Some people just don't like it. And they might turn to this and say, thank you so much, and here's my cease and desist letter, and please give me X amount of dollars for using my work. Um, so just think about that. It's jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, this thing about a moral right is mostly UK law. So when we're getting into, I would think, Canada um, and any of the other UK-based um, uh, countries, you have other rights that attach that are unfamiliar to us normally, and one of them is a moral right. All right, let's go to the next. So what does the claimant have to prove um, to prevail in copyright? All they gotta do is prove that it was fixed, uh, which means you can just hold it basically. It's independently created and it was at least minim minimally creative. Um, and again, I talked about this, it's just, Access was capable and it's substantially similar. So if I take a work, a 50 page work, and I change like five paragraphs to it, and I make it, I reinvert things, and I try to make it look different, I take the title and I switch it. Instead of Alcoholics Anonymous, I call it Anonymous Alcoholics. Um, it's gonna look substantially similar and I'm gonna have a hard time proving that I didn't do something wrong. This could be really costly. We've had a couple of these go down that um, the legal fees have been uh, actually over a million dollars. So be very careful with that. Okay, next one. Okay, how do we avoid copyright infringement? And we haven't even talked about our obligations in Alcoholics Anonymous yet, right? To be vigor rigorously honest, to be loving and kind and, and to treat the world with kindness um, and, and to lead with honor and integrity and dig dignity, right? We just think we can just hack stuff off of people's websites and it's not a big deal. Um, express permission is your number one best way of handling these situations. If you get permission from the copyright owner, we need not worry about it. It's that simple. If you don't get that permission, then you gotta think about, have you gotten a subscription? There's this organization, CCC, which is more like a quasi-government agency that helps bundle thousands of copyrights, mostly for libraries and for universities. Um, you can get a license perhaps that way. But really, the only surefire way to protect the organization would be um, through the express permission. So what does that look like? How about this? I am making an educational pamphlet for distribution in Alcoholics Anonymous. Are you okay with that? Please sign here. It's really, you can do it any way you want. But the reality is you can do that in an email. You can do that. Um, that's going to be considered a binding contract. You can do it on paper. You can do it on a crayon if you want. 
but there's just an example of, of a basic permission that the organization could use or individuals can use. Oh, thank you for that. All right, next one. Okay, defenses to infringement. So now Alcoholics Anonymous Archives has done something and someone has reared their head and they've said, why did you do that? Um, and then we try to defend it. <clears throat> we don't want to be in this situation. And again, there's no reason why we should ever be in this situation. What we'd like to do, and there's a couple, I'm not going to go through them. Um, um, but the bottom one, the fair use, this is where we get in a lot of trouble around the country. And I think people just don't understand what fair use really means. It doesn't mean that I own a copyright and you can fairly use it wherever you want, whenever you want. Um, it means that there's some issues that you've got to think about before you actually use my copyright. And fair use is what we call in the law an affirmative defense, which means I've been sued and then I affirmatively stick this forward as a defensive measure to slow down the lawsuit and try to prove that I'm not culpable. All right, go to the next one. So here, um, fair use defense, these four things are the things that they look at when they determine whether or not a use has been used fairly. So they look at the purpose, the nature, the amount of the work. Was it, you know, 50% of the work or 2.3% of the work or 100% of the work? When it's an image, it's 100% of the work, right? Just remember that. Um, and then number four is the effect on the market. So let me go through quickly a couple examples of this, just because I, I think this is really something people don't understand. So go to the next one. All right. Uh, that okay. All right. It doesn't help us. I just told you why it doesn't help us. Oh, here you go. We need to be rigorously honest. And we have steps 10, 11, and 12 in particular that we're supposed to be abiding by on a daily basis in our own sobriety. So let's think about that if I, if I think maybe this is copyrighted, but maybe I can fit into fair use. Am I being honest about that or am I manipulating the situation? Think about that. All right, now the next slide. This is the one I really wanted. So here's my example A. So there's a website, 10 page uh, manual. I'm gonna hack it and I'm gonna take it for AA and make some educational manual and provide it to the public. We're gonna assume it reaches 10,000 people. The purpose is educational. The nature is kind of factual. It's just factual in nature, which means it's more likely fair use. The amount, the full article was taken. That's not helpful for our problem. And the market effect. Well, that article did cost five bucks um, and now that guy who owned the copyright lost $50,000. Guess what? There's no way we're gonna be deemed at the end of that lawsuit to have done something fairly. Go to the next one. I'm gonna change the facts a little bit. Um, so in B, it's kind of similar, but we got five out of 10 diagrams. So we've only taken 50% of it. And uh, we're doing the same thing. It reaches the same amount of people. And here you go. Just because you change it from 100% down to 50%, it doesn't help us. We're still gonna get dinged and it's not gonna be a fair use. All right, go to C. I'm gonna change it a little bit more. Now we got 10%. Um, so from website C, we're gonna take one page out of 10 pages and we're gonna create our wonderful AA um, manual and stick it on the public website for the whole world to see. And again, we've only taken 10, 10%, but we still have the same problem. This thing costs five bucks a pop. And because it's 10%, that doesn't quite make it to the, what we would call the de minimis level. So we're still not gonna have fair use. And you can see the range of what you, how much of what you take doesn't always help you. All right, go to D. Okay. Now we're in a better range, right? So now we're only taking two paragraphs from a 10 page paper. Can I please take two paragraphs? Um, it's educational. I'm not doing anything with it. The market effect is minimal. I'm not even affecting your market because it was free to the public. But I've now taken the heart of the work. This is like a little nuance within fair use. And if I've taken the main piece and the thrust of what I was trying to copyright, I still not be able, might not be able to use it fairly. And that's what everyone wants. I don't want all the gibberish on the edges. I don't want all the window dressing. I want the heart of the work. And I want that and I'm gonna copy it because it's valuable. And this guy could come to us and say, you copied what was most valuable and you didn't give me credit and you didn't give my permission, so get it off your site. All right, so let's go to the E. 
finally, finally, we get fair use. So it's very small, it's de minimis, one, two, three percent of the work. There's no market effect, so we're good there. And maybe it wasn't the heart of the work. Then you end up in this area of fair use. So who in this room wants to go through this process and look at the grid of fair use to really determine whether or not we can use something fairly? The reality is we just say, that's ah, fair. That's good. Let's go with it. And we do it all the time across the country. I'm not saying AA does that. But um, we see these things happen all the time. So for me, fair use doesn't help as much. All right, let's go to the next. Um, I want to hit a couple other points before we get into the, uh, the found in the collection stuff. <coughs> Are U.S. government or states protected by copyright? No. But if you go to a, a government website, they might have terms of use. And they might tell you how they want it to be used. So just because they don't have copyright doesn't mean they don't have a contractual claim against the Alcoholics Anonymous archives. So just wanted to point that out because we like to pretend everything's in the public domain. Um, go to the next slide. So there's this idea that there's an archives exception in the copyright law. And uh, I would ask all of you to go read it. I think it doesn't really apply to us much. Um, and the reality is it allows a limited number of copies of a copyrighted work to be made in like a library context. But what they don't want to do is get into this idea of having systematic copies being made in an archives and distributed. <clears throat> so it should always, if you think about it, it should always be more of a one-off. Um, so what did I say at the bottom? In order for the infringement exemption to apply the library, and we'd have to qualify as a library, um, it has to demonstrate absence of commercial advantage, sufficient accessibility, and you affix the notice. But there's actually another, which is <coughs> not making uh, systematic copies over and over and again. <coughs> All right, go to the next. Yeah, so here's that. It's a narrow a narrow circumscription. Isolated single spontaneous requests. Someone walks into the library and says, can I make a copy of this? And we say, sure, we can make a copy of that. That's different than making a copy and sticking it on a website. Um, so please don't think that the archives has an exemption under the copyright to do whatever we want to do. Go to the next one. OK, public domain. This is everybody's favorite thing. Um, this at the bottom <coughs> seems kind of harsh, but please, as an organization and as individuals and anybody in the country, we need to really stop assuming that when we find things in the public space that it means that it's in the public domain. So what is the public domain? The public domain usually means that something had a copyright to it, it is expired, it wasn't renewed, and now it has dropped into the public domain. Once an something drops into the public domain, then it is freely accessible, except if I've taken that and I have um, terms of use on my website. So don't ever forget that piece of it. My example is Oh My Darling Clementine. Um, these older works, these classics that no longer have copyright protection. I wrote a book called Clemmy's Pancake House, and there's no way anyone in the world can come after me for copyright infringement. Um, it was a transformative work, and I I used it off of, at like a derivative off of the original story. That for me is a great example because it's in the public domain and things fall into the public domain so that we can continue to create ideas and generate ideas as, as a country. So that was why public domain was uh, initiated, I believe, under the Constitution. It's to give us that uh, innovation. They, the government wants us to innovate and, and to continue to grow. Um, so there's public domain. If it's on a website, it doesn't mean it's in the public domain. <clears throat> okay, go to the next one. <coughs> All right, I guess I've come to the end of the copyright piece. Um, it, Bob, how long do I have? I have like 15 more minutes? You have uh, uh, till 10 o'clock. Oh, half an hour. that's way half too much hour. time. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So this one is... Bob, please do so. Oh, from the, yeah, this is to Bob. Bob passed out to you guys the grid um, that I referenced on, I think, the second or third slide. You want me to read the bottom one? The bottom, on the, on the 
the chart may be freely duplicated yes. or linked to for nonprofit purposes. No permission needed. Please include web address of all reproductions of chart so recipients know where to find any updates. And you'll see the uh, web address there. What was it? Where'd you get that? It's from unc.edu. That's actually, it's a great example because there's an educational organization that has made this available and they have terms and the term was you can use it but <coughs> cite it and do whatever else we just read. For non nonprofit purposes. I'll tell you what, right underneath that link on their website, there is a for-profit purpose, and it's going to be money. It's just what it is. All right, so let's think about um, found and collection stuff. So when you look at the jurisprudence around this, there's intangible and there's tangible things. The intangible things are money, deeds, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, mortgages, checks, coins, things that are more like money. Every state has a survey um, or a uh, law related to how they deal with unclaimed funds. When you get into tangible property, it's a little, a little more vague. And so there might be um, museum-based laws from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and we'll get to Ohio's in a second. Um, but again, I think one of our driving forces is us as an organization to remember when things come to us, I mean, what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous is sacred. That's sacred to me. And I want us to be as, as um, upstanding and loving and kind as we can possibly be. So I think about this whenever we have issues like this. Go ahead. Um, so I threw this slide up here because there are a lot of organizations around the country and, and they're slightly different. Um, I gave you different examples. But there is this Society of American Archivists um, and they have an abandoned property project and there's a lot of information they've put out there that explains how they handle it. And I think there's a lot of organizations that can give us guidance if we need to, number one, create policy or number two, update policy. Um, and reaching out to these organizations, sometimes they're thrilled to death that other people care about them, right? And they want to share ideas. And I think there's avenues out there. The Ohio Historical Society's got a great one. Um, and they have within their policy these things like governance, how to deal with your professional ethics when you're dealing with tangible goods left at a, you know, at a meeting or at central office or at a conference. Um, and then they have a process by which they, they keep things and get rid of things. So again, cultural institutions, there's something called the Cultural Institutions Law Project. And for me, it's really analogous to a nonprofit or, or something like Alcoholics Anonymous, where why reinvent the wheel if we've got other people we can reach out to and see how they've done it, particularly in the same state, if we're talking about regionally here. All right, go to the next slide. Um, so for me, there's some core questions you can ask to build the policy. And I don't know if we have a policy. Do we have a policy? Can anyone answer that question? About when we find things in a collection? All right, so let's assume for today's purposes we don't have a policy and we're going from scratch. So I would say we look at these general questions and you guys probably have other questions you can add to it, but I just wanted to give you a sample. Um, you gotta determine the status of the object itself. Where was it found? Um, does it have an accession number? It probably doesn't. These are sometimes books, and Bob, you could probably tell us all the different types of things that we've, baseballs from some guy from the Indians in the 1930s, right? We've had all kinds of things that could have been left at the door. Um, the bottom two, I think, are the most funny. But, uh, it's just like someone drops it off at the archives, if we have a door at the archives. Um, or it's in a box next to the coffee maker. It's just there and it's valuable. Someone's left something and we think it's really cool for the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so determine the, the object's value or the, um, the status first. And then, all right, go to the next one. So once you figure that out, uh, you gotta figure out if it's really relevant to Alcoholics Anonymous because we don't want stuff in the collection that we don't want. But if we have something that we think is valuable to what we do and to what the history of Alcoholics Anonymous is, then it kind of goes to the next level within that process. Um, I don't know if we 
think it's cool or not to do that, but I think it's important to figure out if it actually has monetary value. You have to really assess this honestly to figure out what this thing is. Um, and it could have other value. It could have just mission, AA mission value. It could have historical value. But let's take a look at this thing and figure out what it is. That sounds more like a museum, but it's okay. Um, go to the next one. Then we gotta figure out what we wanna do with it. And if we don't have a process for by, with this stuff, you know what we're gonna have is somewhere in a closet at central office around the country at all the central offices, there's like a bin. And in the bin is a bunch of stuff. And every six months, somebody opens it and says, ugh, and puts it back in the closet. If we have a process by which we can go through this stuff and inventory what we have and logically demonstrate to the world that we are an organization that understands what it has and what it doesn't have, we have a much more defensible position when we have these issues come up. So. Do we want to add it to the collection or we want to get rid of it? Do we want to sell it to someone else? You know, those are the things that we need to think about when we build our process, since hypothetically we're building a process. All right, go to the next. You got to consider the law in your jurisdiction, and I'm going to touch on ours in a second, but this is just Ohio, right? It can be in Indiana, Utah, Alaska. Um, this is going to change depending on the, the laws of the state. And most of the laws of different states tend to be different. Um, so I'll show you Ohio, but it's not trans it doesn't transfer necessarily over to every other jurisdiction. Um, and again, please, 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 let's remember our guiding principles with the traditions, concepts, and the 12 steps as individuals. All right, go to the next. So they call this the museum property law. And uh, so I'm going to make an assumption that Alcoholics Anonymous fits the category of a museum for this argument. And uh, I just wanted to show you that um, there is a definition for a museum. So a nonprofit corp in yellow, and part of its goal is to have preservation purposes, and we acquire, own, care for, exhibit, study, or archive um, this property. So I think there's a logical assumption that we can be deemed under Ohio law as a museum. Uh, for the purposes of 3385 under the Ohio Revised Code. Um, go to the next slide. So let's make that assumption. Under 07, under the law, there could be a presumption of a gift. And if you can fit these elements, then there can be a presumption that Alcoholics Anonymous then has title to the thing that was left in the coffee box. Um, so you look at, the law literally says this. So any property on or after the effective date of the section, which was like 2003, is delivered to a museum or left at Alcoholics Anonymous's property. We didn't solicit it. It's, we have no idea. It came from Billy Bob or, you know, Sally Mae. We have no idea where it came from. Um, and there's a reasonable standard that says using our judgment as reasonably prudent people, we're not lying about it, um, we can make the assumption, Bob, I turned my phone on so I could hear you call me and then I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> I just interrupted myself. Um, <clears throat> we're making the assumption that it was intended as a gift. So nobody's left a note. Um, this thing, this book, was left in the coffee box with no note at all. It doesn't say, dear AA, you saved my husband's life. I want you to have this $400,000 whatever. And there's nothing. So when there's nothing, we can make that assumption, logically, that it was intended as a gift. Um, that's gonna be conclusive evidence if we can hit these four things logically, that this was meant to be a gift, even though we don't have an actual donor or a name and we can't find that person. They give us a time period under which um, after which we have almost like a cold period where we can't pretend that we own it, which is 90 days. Um, and if there's no claim of ownership during that 90 day window, then the presumption is that we own it. And so from my perspective, we would then move it into the category of an asset owned by Alcoholics Anonymous Archives. Yep. Would, uh, would you have to advertise somehow or another that this thing appeared at your doorstep or in your coffee box? That's a great question, and I was struggling with this the other day, because with unclaimed property laws, there used to be that. 
right? You're going to go to the Cleveland, in Cleveland, it would be the Cleveland Plain Dealer, since it's the only newspaper we have in town. And I would advertise for X amount of days that, hey, I found a Rolex watch on Washington Boulevard in Cleveland Heights. Does anyone own this? Come contact me at blah, 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 blah. And I actually was going back and forth between this and that during the week, and I wasn't seeing the nexus anymore. So I think, and I'm pretty clear about this, that 3385 is the guiding principle when you're dealing with museums, um, which would then supersede what you're talking about, the old common law idea that for 30 days you got to stick it in the newspaper. Um, I will give you guys, and I will promise you this, a definitive answer on that because I think it's a very important point that we have to make. From where I'm at today, I believe that we do not need to do that. But I will give you a memo, and we can document it. Um, all right, so this is the basic thing. So we can make some presumptions in Alcoholics Anonymous that we actually own certain things. And again, uh, we're talking about title to the good. And so if somebody doesn't actually assign title over to us or convey title to us, instead they left it, we can make the presumption after that period of time that we own title to it. But it's important to document that. We have to have a process and a procedure by which we actually document it. Um, if you have any of this information, it would be helpful. And we don't, there's no hard and fast rule here. But if you think about how we would treat ourselves, even though, you know, a tax exempt and nonprofit, we're still an organization and we should function like an organization. And if we have a process by which we document that makes sense and we can apply it consistently around the country, that'd be great. Um, and it certainly helps you later on day 197 when somebody shows up and said, hey, did you see that $400,000 book I left in the coffee box? And then we have another ethical issue that we need to deal with, which is perhaps the true owner has now come back for it. And it was nice while we had it, but maybe we need to give it back. Um, so document, go to the next. And preventing future problems. Again, we made the assumption that we're going to build a policy and a procedure. And I think it's a really important thing to do. And if you guys need help with that, I certainly can offer some help in that regard. But we need a policy. Um, you got to reference your guiding law, and we should make it consistent with our overall mission. Um, <coughs> bottom bullet, um, resolution of issues. That's a section we should never forget about. All right, let's go to the next. OK, so here now we've got a policy. Um, you guys could probably just read this piece. So when executing the policy to address these found in the collection issues, um, I, I mean, think about it. It's, it's pretty basic stuff. What is our process for determining an object's owner? Um, here's what we did, and we tried to find the person or not. Or here's the way that we thought we needed to follow the law. Um, how do we go through the process of obtaining legal rights and ownership? And after the ni on day 91, I would think we had a document that says we have complied with section 3385 and here and after, Alcoholics Anonymous is the sole owner and has title as presumed under the law, and we sign it. Um, all right, let's go to the next. Training. Okay. Think about, you can have, po so I have 47,000 employees at this small non-for-profit that I work for. <laughs> um, and we probably have just as many policies. And a policy is, is uh, is no good if you don't train on it. I'll give you a great example in, in healthcare with HIPAA. I could tell everyone in, in Cleveland Clinic, you need to comply with HIPAA, and they spell it wrong, and they don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But if we train them, it's actually H-I-P-A-A, -A, not H-I-P-P-A. And we start there, and then we extend it, and we a, tell them what their obligations are under that policy. Then they're more likely to comply with it, and we'll have less problems. The same thing holds true for Alcoholics Anonymous. We have to train our people, even if it's very basic informal training. And think about the person who's at the door, who someone drops off a box. They should at least have a, a piece of paper that's posted on the wall um, that says, hey, when someone drops off a box, refer to policy X, and here's a couple, here's a summary of what, what you should be thinking about. If we don't have that, that's a problem, and I think we should fix it. That's just my personal opinion. All right, let's go to the next. And I think that's the end. Okay.
There is no next. The next would be the deed of gift. And Bob had, um, here, go back one so it's at least blue. <laughs> Bob had asked me to look at the deed of gift that we have. And I looked at it, and I started to review this under the law. And there's a couple different ways that you can, you can deed a gift from one organization to another. A lot of this is covered by real estate law, which doesn't help us much. But when you get into actual tangible things that we need to gift, there's some guiding principles. Um, when I looked at ours, and I don't know if anyone has, does anyone ha has anyone seen our deed of gift? Um, it's, so you guys have that in the workbook. The other thing I want to do, if you guys are okay with it, I'm sure no one would mind, I'm going to continue to look at that thing. Um, and here's, here's what I think. I'm happy to hear that it's actually in a guidebook, of, a workbook of some sort, because a lot of organizations, they have a form that is, everyone is told to use, and 16 months later, there are 18 different forms. So I would lock it down in a PDF, make sure people don't have access to it in Word version, that they can change it at their leisure, and make it static. And then once a year, however often you guys need to do it, we review it and make sure it's complying with applicable law. I saw on it that we have a notary on, your, our, on our deed of gift, and I don't know where that came from, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, but I'm again, I owe you one issue on the common law versus 3385, and I'm going to give this group through Bob or whoever um, an affirmative answer on the deed of gift as well. I think it's an extra step that we're taking that we might not need to be taking. And the only reason I say that is, do you always have a notary in the general service office who is actually witnessing the people that are signing it? So that's a real problem. And if we are um, hamstringing ourselves and we literally don't have to, then why would we do it? There are some analogous things in the law where um, I can do my last will and testament in literally the next three minutes. I can write it out on a piece of paper right now and have pick a few of you to be my witness, and that doesn't have to be notarized. Now, when I want to go probate it, I'm going to have to deal with it on a different uh, issue. With deeds of gift, it's a little bit different. I think what we want to do is have, um, let me look at it, because if you guys have that in the workbook, I have a copy too. Yeah. So in the deed of gift, um, I like what we've done because we've taken Alcoholics Anonymous, sort of the mission, and we've overlaid that over intellectual property law, which is we understand as an organization that there's a title transferring from this person to this person. And we do a good job with that. I think it's great. We've got some spaces where we uh, actually want to describe in detail what the thing is. Um, and that's sort of, we don't do that as much as we used to do in the, in the law. <clears throat> but back in the day, they would, when you're describing real estate in particular, it was like 23 feet and two inches, boom. When the moon hits this angle, you can see it. Um, we don't need to do that, but we need to sufficiently describe what we have. And again, <clears throat> It says this gift is made free of any terms and conditions. I would put a period there instead of accept, and I would blow out those next three or four lines because what you want to do is facilitate quick you know, access into the archives. If someone has an issue, they're not going to sign it. So I wouldn't give them the opportunity to think real hard and long about it by saying accept here. I really wouldn't, and I don't think that's dishonest. I think it's just reality. If I'm coming to AA and I say, Babe Ruth was an Alcoholics Anonymous for 40 years, and he drank every Sunday night from this mug, and I want to give it to Alcoholics Anonymous. The process should be pretty straightforward. Purple mug, approximately 72 years old, um, green rim, right? I mean, we can make it pretty basic. Let's, let's help ourselves and not make it too hard. We can get overly legal sometimes, and I don't think that's helpful. So... I'm 99% sure that I don't need a notary for this, but I will give you a 100% definitive answer. Jeff. So would attaching a picture of the item with sufficient detail to indicate its individuality? Yep. 
be helpful or harmful? Perfect. I think it's, could it, is it a double-edged sword? I think it's really helpful because it's showing we're transparent with the owner, right? Because now we're assuming we actually have somebody who's giving something to AA. And if we can take a picture of it, that would be fantastic. Uh, let's think about the downside. So, so, for example, okay, I've got a picture of a first edition cup with the cover closed. Yep. That doesn't really tell me anything. That tells you nothing, but right? If I have a picture of that same book with the cover open and it has an inscription in someone's handwriting, and I've got a good resolution photo of that yep. that matches the object, that's pretty clear. That's very clear. I would even say if you had, if we had the first edition, so you got the red yellow cover, you put a sticky note on the inside of that picture, you take a picture and then you open it and you see the sticky note and the in inscription is right within that. I mean, you can do anything that designates that this object, this picture belongs to this picture and here's what it is. Yeah, I think, again, if we don't have policy around that, then the, the you know, think about the guys in Texas or Arkansas or Michigan, everyone could be doing it differently. And if we don't have a national, here I go, if we don't have a national <laughs> standard by which we actually do this, if we can, it could be troublesome, right? The problem is you're gonna have to, again, IP is gonna be handled mostly on a local level, so it's state by state by state. In Ohio, we can figure out <clears throat> what we do, but if we <clears throat> share jurisdiction with West Virginia or Michigan, we need someone to actually look at the data gift for those jurisdictions as well. I think my takeaway for you guys is we're doing a pretty good job with the data gift. I think we might be doing too good a job. Um, and if we can loosen it a little bit under the law, there's nothing inconsistent with doing that. Um, in the back? Hi, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're actually in the middle of reviewing it, looking at it, amending it to satisfy um, uh, the receipt of electronic um, and digital objects in the archives. Mm -hmm. um, and so the committee would, um, would be looking at it. We're actually looking in the middle of looking at this. And I just wanted to share one experience with DDP that we've had 